you have a talk that explores building an engineering culture. If a company wants to build that culture, what is the very first thing that they need to do? I think they need to understand what it is they're going to try to get out of that culture. Uh, one thing could be that they just want to make decisions faster and be more agile in their thinking, in which case they would want to look to their engineering or product team on how they make decisions about uh, taking action or when a project is complete or how they organize their time. Another thing they might need to do, especially if their customers are technologists, is just better understand the industry and, and what's changing. That's true for us at Safari, for example. So it benefits us if our sales, our marketing team, our executive team understands technology at least just enough. So there's a real benefit for that information sharing to occur inside the organization. So the upsides to an engineering culture, what, what are the primary ones? Uh, for me, I think it's a, the approach that engineers have when it comes to asking for feedback on problems. Mm -hmm. Engineers understand that the code that they write is almost certainly imperfect and would really benefit from the viewpoint of others, whether it's a, through code review or pair programming. And that sense of humility about your own work and asking for feedback from others, I think, is the most important thing that other organizations could draw from the engineering department. So it's a legitimate sense that feedback makes things better. Absolutely. That's, yeah. I think, been one of the most important changes we've made in the practice of software development in the last 10 years is to make it more social, you know, exhibited by things like, by popularity of systems like GitHub, mm -hmm. where coding has become very much a social activity in addition to uh, a one of sort of solitary problem solving. What does it take to convince the non-tech pockets of a company that engineering culture is a good thing? Well, for one thing, if you just look at some of the leaders in the business space, you know, companies like Google and Apple and Facebook uh, have just been so tremendously su successful relying on a kind of engineering mindset. So are there certain things that prevent an, an, an engineering transition from taking place? Uh, it's definitely a, any kind of culture that is still very hierarchical and mm -hmm. command and control uh, is is going to uh, run up against the ethos of open source and collaboration that engineers really love. And it'll be very difficult for those kind of groups to see common ground. Uh, if you think about decisions having to always be made from the top down, moving to a consensus-driven approach can be pretty difficult. I want to take, go back to the feedback for a second there. It seems like such a logical thing, right? Where it's the, obviously more feedback would generally improve things. For those non-tech pockets that I was referring to before, is that is that where the real culture clash comes in? Because I know in certain spaces, feedback isn't necessarily something that really people really, or they say they want it, but they don't actually want it. In the engineering world, no, no, they actually want it. Is that where the real gap is? I think so. Uh, there's, a, there's sometimes a fear that if you open things up for feedback, it will just be chaos, or you'll have to answer questions that you might not be comfortable answering. And there needs to be a willingness to say, I'll take a certain amount of chaos and a certain amount of noise, and, and maybe I'll have to repeat myself a few times or re-justify my actions. But I have, I'm convinced that it's worth it in the long term to get a broader perspective from the organization. And feedback isn't the same thing as blame. No, right? no, absolutely. In, in fact, I think one of the practices that engineering has done a really good job with that could, they could bring to the organization is the, the idea of postmortems and that they are blameless and that they are a way of just replaying the facts of what happened to arrive at a better solution the next time a problem like that occurs. I'm going to shift gears completely right now. Back in the day we used to talk about the publishing industry, e-books, e-readers, devices like that. Are you surprised at how, at how things have played out over the last, I don't know, five, six years? I, I definitely had a more uh, optimistic view of where publishing was going to go three or four years ago. And I think maybe what actually happened was, was pretty natural, where the industry just matured. And we reached a point of equilibrium between um, what seemed like an apocalyptic battle between print books and e-books. <laughs> uh, and you know, neither side won. They right. both have their roles, and people like them in different contexts. Um, most people who read e-books also still love things about print. And I think that's just where we've settled in as that industry has matured. Last question for you. What people or projects are you following these days? I've been, one of the things I did in, in order to prepare for my talk was I interviewed a number of engineering leaders from other organizations. And I deliberately only interviewed women just as a, a kind of way to get a broader perspective on culture and engineering as an organization. And I was surprised by how 
many senior women in engineering roles I was able to find just when I looked. And I, I think it points to maybe a, a positive direction that the conversation about diversity could go, which is that maybe it isn't actually as bad as we think, but we just see a lot of bad actors getting a lot of attention. So I'm, I'm interested in in women in particular who are kind of leading by example in those organizations and affecting change at the ground level. Great. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.